Uh, tonight's event is the Burbank Public Library's commemoration of Women's History Month. I chose this topic, that of working mothers, because all of my working life I've seen so many of my colleagues struggle with trying to handle both work and caring for their children, and because over all that time it seems to me that things have improved for them very little, if at all. I've wondered why. I asked Amy Westervelt to come here tonight because I liked her approach to finding answers to that question. She has found it valuable to look to history, at other cultures, and at the experience of marginalized groups within our own society to try to find answers. This is out of fashion these days. Our focus seems to be more personal, immediate, and narrow. Her work, I think, proves that looking more broadly at the trials of others, both past and present, is a way of trying to understand things that has an enduring value when we seek to address the challenges we face in our own lives. And forget having it all, Mr. Westervelt quoted a writer, Frigga Haig, we think, <laughs> who I think framed the issue more clearly than I've seen it expressed before. Quote, what look like female values are regulations of society at large to protect, conserve, love, and rescue life. It is because these are demanded as actions and attitudes from individual women and not from a social structure that women are oppressed. We talk a lot about sustainability these days and about how things we are doing are not sustainable. I don't know all the things on that list, but I can tell you this is one of them, that this allocation of things is not sustainable. And I think the same can be said for another thing that comes of failing to have a social structure that makes it the business of all of us to support these values, namely the large number of children in our society who are growing up in poverty. It is not just mothers and parents that have a stake in the care and raising of children, it's all of us. Believing that those who come after us will survive, that they will be able to have a good life, is something that has impact on our own lives. And when we don't have that faith, the experience and the quality of our own lives is diminished. I'm fortunate to have learned that through, that, through the opportunity that this library gave me to work with children for many years. And I thank my colleagues who work with children in this library who have helped not only working mothers but all parents in the effort they make daily to enrich the lives of children in this community. What they do is the heart and soul of this library. Amy Westervelt is an award-winning journalist with 20 years of experience writing about health, psychology, technology, business, and environment issues. Her work has appeared in The Guardian, Popular Science, The Wall Street Journal, and Elle. She is winner of the Rachel Carlson Award and is a Murrow Award-winning radio journalist. She is the producer and host of several popular podcasts, including Gaslit Nation and Tell Me About Your Mother. She will be talking tonight with Elise Hu of NPR West, who has so kindly agreed to be a part of this evening's program. Ms. Hu was the founding bureau chief and international correspondent for NPR's Seoul office, where she was based for three years, and she was responsible for coverage of the Koreas and Japan. She filed from a dozen countries across Asia. Her reporting has been honored with the National Edward R. Murrow Award for Video and the Gannett Foundation Award for Innovation in Watchdog Journalism. She has received beat reporting awards from the Texas Associ Associated Press and the Austin Chronicle twice named her Best of Austin for reporting and social media work. Please join me in welcoming tonight Amy Westerfeld and Elise Hu. Okay. Hi. Thanks for, thanks for being here. Um, we're going to talk, well, Elise is going to ask me a few questions. We're going to talk about the book a little bit, and then we'll have some um, Q&A with the audience. So, Yes. So just kind of a road map. We want to leave plenty of time for you all, so we'll probably go and have a conversation for about 30 minutes or so, and then um, leave the final 15 to 20 for you um, so that you can ask Amy whatever you want. Yeah. 
Um, for those of you who haven't read the book, it's right here. It's called Forget Having It All, How America Messed Up Motherhood and How to Fix It. And so as is my work and your work, I, I think the central question is how did things get to the, be the way they are? Yeah, yeah. Um, well, there's a lot of ways. Um, so a lot of what I, a lot of what I kind of wanted to do with the book was was really look not at um, necessarily my own personal experience, which I've written about before, and I feel like is somewhat similar to the stories that I've seen lots of other women write. Um, but look at why there's this huge and growing mountain of what I call um, miserable mom literature <laughs> and you know why why is it why is it why is it get, like why is it out there why is it growing and why does it seem like it just keeps getting worse which Hubert kind of touched on too um, especially given that you know various other things have sort of progressed in the last 50 years or so why is this one issue kind of remained so intractable um, and I I looked through um, history of both, you know, immigrants to this country and uh, Native American people and lots of different cultures to see, like, you know, kind of how this, how this situation came about and how all of our ideas about American, well, about motherhood in the U.S. came about. And, and I think, um, honestly, I kind of feel like, like most issues in this country, it all kind of comes back to an obsessive focus on the individual and on every individual's um, every individual being responsible uh, to and for only themselves, um, and that really extends to the family. Um, you know, the nuclear family isn't an American invention, but we certainly double down on it here, and um, in some ways, that was a a matter of just sort of practicality. You know, a lot of the initial uh, colonists here were apart from their extended families. You know, they came here on their own, and so um, they <clears throat> made do with what they had. Um, and then, in a lot of cases, uh, other people who came here were separated from their families too, either by force or um, because that was the only way to sort of make the, the leap. So we kind of have this beginning of, you know, every family being isolated. And we haven't moved that far away from, from that in the last 200 years, I would say. There's still very much this feeling of if you're not figuring it out on your own, you're the problem. Um, yeah. But this is, when you trace the history, um, you trace it to the European colonists, to America, right? Yeah. There is a difference, and you spell this out in the book, yeah. between um, you know the 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 forefathers and their families and Native Americans and yeah. and that population. Why mm -hmm. did you try and spell out this difference and research yeah. kind of how indigenous populations? Yeah. Well, <clears throat> a lot of the um, a lot of the conversations about this stuff tend to focus on a very narrow sort of you know European uh, Anglo American experience and um, you know the many I mean. Native America, Native American is like a broad term, you know, for, for lots of different tribes that had lots of different um, approaches to things. But in, in large part, there was very much a, a, a sort of communal approach. It was many tribes were very matricentric, which doesn't necessarily mean female centric, but centered around these values that um, Hubert touched on in his intro that, you know, um, the values of the, the community above the individual and of the necessity for every Everyone to sort of be working together um, to ensure the the health of the community, which also meant everyone kind of helping out with children. There was a very strong tradition of um, what anthropologists call allo parents, which is like extent you know people who aren't related to you that um, that help out with with kids in the community um, in those communities, and that um, that tradition and that uh, culture was extremely frayed by the imposition of you know Anglo culture on top of it um, in a lot of ways you know when um, when colonists came over and started to sort of set up their idea of how this country should look uh, the, the way that Native American populations were approaching family was seen as um, as aberrant and was seen as you know something that was was problematic and was um, that they needed to 
get in line with how you know the the sort of white Christian population was doing things. So there's been sort of this this history of um, not only kind of ignoring other approaches, but actually pathologizing them in a way that I don't think is very <laughs> is very helpful. Not just for all of the the sort of obvious reasons, but also because then. You know, we don't we don't have a, a sort of wide range of, of options and um, examples to choose from. We just see this like same thing over and over again. And if we kind of broaden that lens, then we we're like, oh, okay, maybe maybe this works better for me, and maybe I'll take something from there. And maybe you know, um, I don't know. I think if there's a little bit more cross pollination, then we get to better solutions. Yeah, you look at a lot of um, you know, there's a lot of sort of lean in type books out there right now. There is. Um, yeah. But what's unique about this one, if you haven't read it, is it looks at how history and the economy um, and race, issues of race, have really made and shaped our culture around caregiving and uh, around work. And both these things are now seen as a binary, right? Uh, that, that, yes. that you have to balance work and motherhood as if they're on two opposite poles. Right. Uh, what's messed up about that? Because you call it messed up. I know. I wanted to call this book Rise of the Matriarchy. <laughs> but apparently that's not a good sales title. Um, <laughs> uh, yeah, I mean, well, okay, there's a few things. First of all, of course, like, um, although we talk about them as a binary or as like two separate worlds, it's usually one person doing these things, right? So like you don't, in your brain, these things are not like super divided. They're all jumbled up all the time. And like, you know, and in your life too, like they're constantly coming into contact with each other. You know, like how many times have you been at work where you've gotten a call from the school or like, you know, or you- Or a call from your husband. Call from your husband or like, a, you know, you suddenly remember that, you know, it's a minimum day today, or whatever. <laughs> um, so <laughs> it happens all the time. Um, so yeah, exactly. Yeah. So um, so you know, talking about it as these two separate things doesn't seem, you know, doesn't seem productive because it's not how anyone's life is actually set up, and not how anyone's life actually works. Um, but also, we were talking earlier about the. Um, you know the economic drivers behind all this stuff so there's there are all these times in history where you can see that oh suddenly cultural norms shift because the economy needs something different so during world war ii and you know um we needed more workers in factories suddenly all the norms around you know what was and wasn't okay for moms to do shifted um and then as soon as can you give an example of how that shifted and well, um, when more women went into the well, workforce actually there was interesting like at the beginning of the war <clears throat> it was still very much you know mothers shouldn't be in the workplace especially if their kids are younger than like 12 or 13 then the age of the kids started to go down about like midway through and then by the end it was like all hands on deck, you know, <laughs> and to the point where there was a, you know, government subsidized daycare because companies were complaining that um, mothers who were employed but, you know, maybe like didn't have, like would suddenly need to stay home and take care of their kids would like not show up to work. So the government sort of stepped in, provided quite a bit of support for childcare centers, um, including actually oversight, which is something that, um, gets missed out of a lot of the talk around um, government support for childcare. It's not just money, it's also, you know, a little bit more consistency in standards across the board too. And structure, yeah. Yeah. So so this is something that I learned about when reading your book, that there was a period in American history in which there was government subsidized yeah. child care nationwide, kind of federally govern federal government subsidized child care. A lot of and this is beyond Head Start, which started under LBJ. Yes. Yeah. So this is for Babies, even. Mm -hmm. um, can you talk about what, what? The, talk a little bit about that period. We're kind of getting to it, but then also, what happened to it? Yeah. Um, so yeah, it was authorized under uh, the Langham Act, um, and funds were appropriated fairly quickly. And um, it wasn't like the government went around and set up childcare centers. They funded centers that were already existing. But there was also uh, quite a bit of, of um, support for on-site. Childcare at different companies and like at shipyards and things like that too. Um, and then, um, as soon as the armistice was declared, they you know they started you know 
putting putting the like closures in in process. And actually, California was one of the main states to request an, an extension of funding because I think it was it had the largest number of, of mothers in the workforce at that time and, and was using the, the child care centers the most. So I think we got a couple years extension. Um, but then, you know, within about five years it was it was basically removed. Um, I think maybe five percent of funding remained for, for some very low income um, communities and, and a lot of that actually ended up getting rolled into Head Start when it started. Um, yeah, it just, and then, you know, in the 70s, we, we almost had it again. <laughs> right, that was crazy. So, yeah, just real briefly, because I still want you to, you know, talk yeah. a little bit more about the problem, but in yeah. the 70s, there was almost, yeah. you know, subsidized child care yes. for was all a, the states. Yeah, there was a bipartisan bill. It was co-written by the Nixon administration, so everyone was on board. The only sort of negotiating that was happening was around budget. And then... Um, Pat Buchanan um, <laughs> decided that this would ruin the American family, and so he kind of put a bug in Nixon's ear, and he start, he went through uh, a lot of the religious communities and started really riling people up, claiming that it was going to be forced childcare, <laughs> that actually you were going to be required to drop your children off at government-run <laughs> childcare centers, and it sounded scary, so people were, you know, started agitating against it, and um, and Nixon. And rejected it and made a big speech about how it was, you know, going to ruin the American family and was a slippery slope to communism. Um, so, but the thing that always ticks me off about this is that, you know, the government has great childcare for its own employees. The Pentagon has one of the oh, best yeah, childcare DOT, centers right. in the country, you know. Um, so obviously, like someone somewhere thinks that it's a good idea and that it's, you know, it's smart to fund it for yeah, some people. Six hundred dollars a month. Yeah, yeah. And it's like the highest quality. It's really, you know, it's constantly winning awards for child development, you know, training and all that stuff. So, yeah. So for those of you who haven't read the book, I asked Amy to prepare a little excerpt that um, if you could read to us, just um, that really crystallizes the argument that you're trying to set up as the premise. And then we'll pivot to solutions because yes. the second part of that <laughs> that, yeah. that, that subtit or subtitle is how to fix it. And how to fix it, yeah. I mean, you know, I wish I could fix it, but <laughs> we'll try. Okay, so this is, um, this is sort of talking about the, the issue that I think faces all working parents and honestly all working people in the U.S. right now, which is the idea of, of the ideal worker in the U.S. workplace, which is roughly someone who can work late at a moment's notice, go on a business trip anytime, and kind of has someone else at home taking care of everything else in their life. Um, so I start with an example from my own life. <clears throat> All right, in 2016, three months after giving birth to my son, I had to take a consulting gig that required me to work around 50 or 60 hours a week and be away from home one to two days a week. I didn't want to do this, but we were broke, my husband didn't have a job, and I had to take what I could find that would pay good money quickly. Every week, I'd pack some clothes plus my breast pump and bags and a little construction orange cooler to store pumped breast milk. Then, to minimize time spent away, I'd wake up at 4 a.m., drive to the office, and pump once along the way. Yes, while driving. This would almost always result in breast milk getting dribbled on my shirt. Also, <laughs> the 4 a.m. wake up plus the night feedings meant I was operating on about two hours of sleep. So I would drink coffee, yes, while breastfeeding, I know, which combined with exhaustion would make me sweat. All of which is to say that by the time I'd get to the office and into my first meeting, I looked like the frazzled working mom I was. <laughs> my male colleagues, however, most of whom also had young kids and infants at home, were showered, calm, and fully immersed in work. It was easy to see how any one of them would have had much better ideas than me on such a morning or done better work. Arlie Hochschild mentions this in her preface to the 2003 reprint of The Second Shift, noting her jealousy of both male colleagues who had a spouse at home taking care of everything and female friends who were able to solely focus on their children. We still ask mothers to parent as though they don't work and work as though they don't parent. And meanwhile, the ideal worker myth driving all of this, the idea of the worker who has no life outside a job, is bad for everyone's life satisfaction, irrespective of their parental status, 
and it's bad for productivity too. Recent research indicates that workers in Norway and Belgium, where work weeks are capped and employees are given a fair amount of flexibility and time off, are more productive than US workers. Meanwhile, the United States is clinging to a workplace ideal that makes everyone miserable. True. Truth. <laughs> um, yeah. So, okay. Solutions. Um, I, I, like a big part of this book is that um, I, I really feel that um, a lot of the discussion around this stuff has centered on policy and this sort of like, oh, if we could just get maternity leave or like if we can just get childcare, then all of this stuff will go away. But um, obviously, I think we all know if we think about it for a minute that that's probably not true. Um, that there are a lot of cultural forces at play underneath all of the policies. And so each chapter, I try kind of get into some of the history, the problem, and then um, both a cultural solution and a policy solution that can kind of complement it. Um, yeah, and I just want to yeah. interrupt you right here because um, there are examples in which these policy changes, like subsidized daycare, like offering more parental leave, yeah. were enacted in countries uh, where they were trying to get more working moms into, or more moms into the workplace, right. and yet that didn't work. So, can yes. you talk a little bit about how policy couldn't drive cultural change yes. and why they need to be ha happening together? Yeah, yeah. So, I um, because I had this idea, didn't want to just go. Well, the solution is to turn the U.S. into Sweden. <laughs> you know, like yes, Swedish policies are awesome, and they work great there, and they've put a lot of work into making sure that they work great there. Because actually, even there, the policy wasn't enough. They had to actually do a lot of cultural work to make sure that the policy was adopted. Um, but I, I um, started looking around to see if there was a country that was a little more similar to the U.S. economy and political system, and I. Um, I started, I ended up researching Japan because um, they did exactly this thing and they went to Sweden and uh, it was Sweden, Norway, Denmark and France. They sent ministers to go and write down literally the policies, you know, very carefully and bring them back and um, and implement them. And so they, they, they implemented all the policies that we kind of talk about being the fix here. So it was maternity leave, equal paternity leave, government subsidized child care, flex time, you know, all of it. And um, they had very low adoption of any of these policies, but they, they except for the childcare, which they childcare they just couldn't open was, enough of. They yeah. didn't have enough caregivers. Yeah, yeah, the childcare was that was yeah. They didn't have enough caregivers, and then there were <laughs> there were there was like a big. Uh, did you? I don't know if you were there when like the the mom um, who blogged like screw you, Jap like Japanese government. I can't get my kid into daycare. It was like very yeah, because there's waiting lists and, and, and yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, but. As far as especially um, paternity leave and flex time, they um, they found that uh, it was around like 40% of people really wanted to be taking advantage of those policies, but less than 3% actually were because they had a context like a, a context mismatch. So you know you were allowed technically to do those things, but. Um, Everyone felt like their boss would frown upon, would frown on it, and like the workplace in general, that they would be seen as lazy or um, not a good worker. So they started doing well, and also it was just sort of seen as not a thing that fathers in particular do, right? So they started this whole um, care for their children is something yeah. that they're I mean, yeah, like it's not, it's not. Uh, it hadn't been really encouraged as like a, a thing in the culture there. So they started this whole cultural propaganda campaign called the Ecumen Project. It was like aimed at getting dads more involved and making it cool to be an involved dad. So it's like rock stars and athletes and actors and you know like wearing babies and whatever. And that did start to shift the culture a little bit. And then they did the research again and they found, okay, still low adoption. And they realized that um, the executives were a big problem. So. So it's work culture that is a real sure. Yeah. So now they're starting to do kind of the the Iku boss program, and they're trying to make it cool to be a cool boss. <laughs> um, <laughs> you should take the time that's allotted to you. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and also they're trying to. I mean, in you know, it's they're trying to allay any sort of anxiety around if my if my staff goes home early, you know, productivity is going to drop, and then like, because I mean, it's been very tied into the culture there that it's that like, you know. 
if productivity drops, then like the economy will fail and it's all of our faults and you know that kind of thing. So um, so anyway, it was a, a very good example of you know what, making sure that you're understanding all the cultural forces at play <clears throat> and not just relying on policy to do the work. I, I feel like the um, the universal child care policy that's being proposed right now, I, like that's my one sort of concern about that is that. Um, there's a bunch of policy mechanisms, but we still we still have I mean we have like a hundred year history of pathologizing pathologizing um, daycare like we like on top of all of the times that we've had it and then gotten rid of it and that it's been considered something that might ruin the American family. Um, I mean, even the very first daycare centers that were set up in um, the progressive era, which were set up to help low-income moms because we had more orphans with living mothers and orphanages than, mm. than actual orphans because they just had working moms that couldn't take care of them. Um, the woman who ran that for 30 years spent the entirety of her career um, dissuading people from using childcare unless they were in a crisis. <laughs> so when, so you're, when you're saying that our culture pathologizes daycare or yeah. childcare outside the home, you're saying that our culture then um, favors mothers taking care of their yes. children instead of fathers and um, other caregivers in general? Yeah, I mean mostly there's still very much a, um, an emphasis put on mothers in particular doing it. And, and I, um, I don't say that to disparage fathers or to, um, you know, I, I mean I think... But there's a lot sort of of social scripts sort of telling us yeah. that you to should be the one. To the detriment of fathers, too. Like, I have, I, um, I have a, a friend whose husband's a stay-at-home dad, and it's like, uh, I mean, it's a lot of um, emotional labor for him to deal with, like, the constant sort of criticism of him for doing that and, like, you know, or weird Or congratulations, comments. right? There's or also weird congratulations. Sexism, right? Like, <laughs> oh, look at you. Yes. You're yeah. taking care of your kid. Yeah, yeah. I don't know. So there's a lot of a lot of hangups around um, those roles. So fast forward then, um, if policy change and all of these big ideas mm -hmm. um, can't happen alone, yeah. what can we individually be thinking about, and what can we individually be doing in our own families yeah. to help make it better for our sons and daughters? Because this, of, of, of course, affects all of society. Yeah. Um, I think, well, you know, um, sort of gendered roles in the home get embedded in, in kids' minds very early. Say a little bit more about that. What do you, what is it? Um, so the idea that, like, mom is the one that is parenting all the time and or, you know, cooking or whatever. And dad, like, there's a lot of, you know, mom is the emotional caregiver and dad is the, like, financial caregiver <laughs> and that kind of stuff. Um, the things that kids see their parents doing and the roles that they see their parents taking on um, gets really locked in their minds by about five, age five. Wow. Um, so as much as you can, like, try not to fall into the stereotypical roles. It's hard, you know, everyone, everyone's doing what they can and things have to get done, you know, in the house. So I, I'm, I'm not under any illusion that like everyone has the luxury of time to be like, you know, laying out a perfectly gender neutral household, <laughs> um, you know, but as much as you can try to, you know, encourage boys to do you know, cooking tasks and girls to do, like, take out the trash and stuff like that. And you talk about boys babysitting, having your yeah, boys babysitting. I think that's a big one. Because um, we do, I mean, my son, from the time he was, like, three till he was about five, was um, every time someone would ask him what he wanted for his birthday, would say he wanted a baby doll. And the reactions that people had were like... Oh no, you don't want that. Those are baby dolls are for girls. Was the message that he kept hearing, and I was just like, well, if like if that's the if that's the message that you're hearing from age three, the babies are for girls. Like, you know, how are we going to uh, encourage um, these boys who grow these into boys to think that like fatherhood is a natural thing, and that you know, because that's the other thing too is like this notion that only mothers are naturally suited to caregiving. And you bust through that myth, is, myth in the book, right? It, yeah, it has no basis in in anything. It's like it's completely culturally fabricated. Um, so yeah, 
I think men can be just as good at raising kids as women, and there's no reason to delay them, you know, <laughs> learning how until the minute that they have a baby. Um, you know, like I, I think I complain about my husband in that regard in his book too. <laughs> that like, had he, you know, had he been encouraged to babysit, then um, his own children wouldn't have been like the first children that he had any experience caregiving yeah. for, you know. Um, and it wouldn't have been such a rough transition, I think. Similarly, like if, you know, I think in the reverse, if, if it, um, in the absence of this notion that mothers should just immediately take, or that women should take to mothering like a duck to water, um, like I think it's, it's, it's hugely problematic for That's a lot of pressure. Yeah, that's a lot of pressure for a woman, right? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I don't remember what your question was or whether I no, answered it. No, just individually. It. Yeah, what, <laughs> okay. what we could be doing in our Oh, homes. individually. Yeah. Okay, the other thing is that I will say, um, I have an essay coming out on this exact topic oh, next fantastic. week. Uh, I think we have this very romantic notion about how this stuff should work, that it should just sort of naturally work itself out, and that like if you and your partner um, don't automatically kind of fall in line with each other, that there's something wrong in the relationship or something wrong with your partner or whatever. Um, so I have been really like banging the drum around <laughs> just being really pragmatic about stuff. Like have a conversation about who's gonna do what, you know? Um, and in fact, when I was researching the book, I interviewed quite a few um, lesbian and gay couples that had kids about how they had oh yeah because the because the pre-existing gender gender roles wouldn't be there yeah. right and um the key a key difference actually most people said that um that irrespective of of gender one partner would take on the traditional mom role and one wow. partner would take on the traditional dad role wow. um which is interesting but beyond that the, the key difference was that um you know, there was just a lot more straightforward conversation up front of who's going to do what, you know, and um, who's going to work more. And it was kind of like, well, I make more money, so maybe I'll work more at the beginning, and you know, then we'll trade off in a couple years or whatever. Um, versus most hetero couples I know do not have those conversations. In fact, I interviewed over 200 people um, to do this book about what what kind of conversations they had about this before they got married and um, like over 80% said either we didn't talk about it at all or not not married before they had kids we didn't talk about it at all or we barely talked about it <laughs> so you know waiting until uh oh sorry waiting until it's um, a crisis is never a good time to have those conversations um, and I think if we could bring ourselves to just be like more practical about it and not assume that you know it's gonna work itself out that would help too yeah. Yeah. okay fantastic the book again is right up here and it's on sale at a discounted price in the back um, we have about 15 minutes left so it's y'all's turn um, Amy, are you finding in your research that uh, major corporations are starting to give um, equal uh, parental leave for women and their spouses? Yeah. Because I have found that uh, recently in my family mm -hmm. that that's happening. And I personally, I think that's something that will help yeah what you're talking about yeah I think it'll I think it'll help a lot it's um it's becoming much more common um, but there is this issue of the culture versus policy mismatch happening where I've, I've heard it, yeah. well men aren't taking it but also I've heard from a lot of, of um, couples where um, when the man when the man tries to take it he does actually get flack at work about it which isn't legal <laughs> but but it still happens you know and even when it's not really direct negative feedback it can be sort of you know insinuated um, I know I had one friend who, yeah, was, was convinced. I mean, I don't know. And then a lot of times it's like, you know, they go back to work and maybe they're like passed over for a promotion or, you know, stuff like that. But I, I think it would help a lot too. Um, one woman I talked to was saying that that is, is something that um, she, she kind of like consults with companies who are trying to do these policies and she's pushing for that because um, on top of 
making it an even cost for the company, which kind of reduces the the um, tendency to pay women less and especially pay mothers less and all that kind of stuff. It also um, kind of immediately makes both partners uh, aware of all of the the baby care and child care stuff. So like this woman I was talking to was saying that in her case, um, she had taken off six months, her husband had taken two weeks, and so therefore, by the time she went back to work, she was the one that knew the nap schedule, the feeding schedule, like everything, and he had no idea because he just hadn't been there. So I think um, having both parents experience all of that from the beginning would help a lot. Um, I actually think too, and I lay this out in the book and it's probably too detailed, but I, I actually think um, figuring out a way to do staggered leave between the parents would be great because uh, it would be less of a hit for companies and then also <clears throat> I really think it's important for both parents to experience solo parenting <laughs> um, because that, you know. Yeah, I have some girlfriends who say, who have four kids, right, and still yeah. won't leave their husbands alone with the kids. Yes. Yeah. Um, I hear that again and again, and I, I'm, I'm stunned by that because I yeah. don't think that I would be able to be here right now, for Me example, but for my husband kids. being able to watch all three of my children. So. Yeah, yeah. I mean, that that some of that's imposed too, self-imposed. Self I feel, imposed. yeah, I, I have friends who have real hang-ups about, you know, things being done a certain way with the kids all the time and you know I'm like you gotta let that go man like let it go, yeah. <laughs> let it go. <laughs> yeah where, okay where as women really have to also promote that in our homes I mean these gender stereotypical roles that we often we often impose on ourselves yeah I'm a mom a working mom not, not a full-time working mom but I'm a, I took 10 years off to raise my children and went back <clears throat> after 10 years and it was such an adjustment to our family, but it was also about me giving up how I had done things for 10 years yeah. um, and being okay with it. Mm -hmm. um, and because you do set yourself on these trends and your children are watching them. Yeah. And it was really interesting. My daughter was my firstborn. Um, I was going to go back to work during school hours. Nothing was really going to impact their lives. And they had such a hard time just knowing that I wasn't going to be home. And I said, and, and through tears, I said to her, "Why? What's going on? What do you think is going on? Well, you're not going to be here." And I said, "You're not here when I'm you're not going to be here." And but it was really interesting. It took her a year. A year later, she's all ten, 10 years old. She said, "Mommy, I'm so sorry. I think I was mean when you went back to work." <laughs> but you know, and I said to her, "You weren't mean. You voiced, you know, obviously the challenges." not a new child but you know uh, <laughs> but what do you think was happening she said i just didn't know what it was going to look like yeah and so i would not go back and I, I always say you know and i speak to young women i years ago that you're probably very familiar with this article published by Anne marie slaughter yeah. of the atlantic magazine yeah. it was I, I think it was a fascinating article it was so empowering yeah and it really supported my decision in, in to stay home yeah um, but that we can't have it all. And that, yeah. you know, I, I was just sharing with a group of women today that after interviewing, that 10 years after, you know, being home and going back and I had to grab the bull by the horn in the room I interviewed and say, no, there is a big gap in my resume. Yeah. Um, but it's not without, you know, I, I've been home raising children, managing schedules. And we have to yeah. really just, I mean, there's so many sides to this conversation. We have to empower our role as moms as well. Yeah not minimize it as something that is, um, you know, I, I was home, staring at lodging, that was yeah. really meaningful things. Um, but anyway, so I yeah. know, I think it's less of a question, more of a comment, a, a conversation that I truly appreciate you bringing um, to our communities. Yeah. Because the more we talk about this, the more we can feel confident, whatever role we do choose to take yeah. as women, and then we support each other because at the end of the day, we have a really love hate relationship with stable moms and working moms, and we yeah. really not, you know, we, uh, we're very critical of each other yeah. on both sides of the, the spectrum. And so I think we just really need to understand that it, we have choices. Mm -hmm. And whatever those choices are, we can carry them out yeah. confidently. Yeah. I think. Um, the, the whole um, placing value on caregiving thing is really 
a critical uh, cultural change that needs to happen because we do I mean it's like oh you're just a mom I've heard so many um, women say that oh I'm just a mom like what you know don't <laughs> why do your own work. yeah don't yeah and um, yeah. and you know it trickles down to everything like even <clears throat> I was talking to a woman who's a nanny and she was saying you know I've thought about doing different jobs but you know whenever I go into an interview and they ask, and they ask me for my work experience and they then they go like oh well you know you ha- like like you haven't really done anything you know and um, I was like that that's so messed up and also um, not reflective of the actual value, even if you're looking at it purely from an economic standpoint. Um, childhood development is very important. It's a huge part of you know the fabric of our the society. fabric of our society and the quality of our workforce. If you really want to get like you know Too capitalist good. about it, so you know um, even if you're looking at it purely from an economic standpoint, and this is the thing that I get irritated about too. That you know at the same time that we have people wringing their hands about the birth rate, um, you know we have we have people who are saying like there shouldn't be any support for working families and there shouldn't be any you know um, any child care support and all of that kind of stuff and there shouldn't be any money going into preschools and early child development it's like okay um, so we want more humans but we don't want to actually you know ensure that they'll be productive members of society yeah, that doesn't make sense to me um, yeah I don't know anyway I agree I think that the um, the care, um, the value of, of caregiving in general needs to be appreciated. And not, I mean, across the board, like not just of children. Not just but children, but also our parents, right? Elder care is a huge and growing issue too that, you know, a lot of, and there again, it's like, well, you know. We don't pay those caregivers, you know, elder care caregivers enough. Oh, and No, yeah. And then, <clears throat> in fact, actually, like there was a big study that was done about elder care in particular and the fact that there's a growing need for care workers and that, there is a very, um, there's a gender dynamic there too, and um, there's been quite a bit of research around a significant number of men not wanting to take those jobs because they're feminized, which makes me angry, <laughs> um, you know. But it's like, but it's like, okay, well, why is that happening again? Because we don't place value on care. And why would someone who um, doesn't need to, isn't being required to in any way, voluntarily take on something that society says has no value? Same thing with, you know, involved fatherhood. Why, like, why, you know, why would anyone voluntarily take on an unappreciated job? They wouldn't, <laughs> you know? So we have to shift the value to, to make it appealing. Before I wrote the book, I, I wrote this very ranty essay in the middle of the night because um, when I had my sec- my second child was very unplanned and came at a time when I was the sole provider for our family and I um, I was self-employed so I couldn't take I mean I was a freelancer so I couldn't take maternity leave. Um, and so I literally took off like a couple hours to have a baby, <laughs> and then uh, <laughs> and then was right back at it. Um, yeah. So and and I also because in the with my first kid I had told people that I was um, pregnant and that I was going to take a couple months off, and I, <clears throat> I had one person fire me, and I had everyone else just like slowly disappear. So this time, because my income was our sole income, I was like, all right, I'm not even gonna let anyone know. Um, and so I, um, I, yeah, so I, like two, two weeks after my kid was born, I was like walking to the mailbox to get a check and feeling really proud of myself. Like, oh, look, I mean, I didn't even take any days off and I'm still getting checks coming in and, you know, no one even knows I had a baby and I felt actually really proud of myself. And then I was like, God, that is, that's really messed up. What, like, what is telling me to feel proud of that? Um, so, you know, I think there's a, there's an aspect of, um, of all the like kind of lean in stuff and some of second wave feminism too that that's like done this weird thing of of also saying like this perfectly natural thing that only women can do is somehow um, weak and shameful 
you know, um, that I think we really need to get rid of Brain too. Damage. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So anyway, I wrote this essay that was called "Having It All Kind of Sucks," and because <laughs> that's how I felt in, at 2 a.m. Um, and then that's that's kind of like how this this title came about. But uh, but yeah, I think all of that really needs to be reexamined. And I mean, I I also just like I, I have a lot of issues with that phrase in general. I think uh, you know I've never felt entitled to having it all, and um, I don't think that most men would say that they have it all. And I don't. You know, and um, and if you listen to Anne Marie Slaughter talk about that Atlantic article that yeah. was so galvanizing, she defined it very. Um, narrowly as yes. what she, she one she says she wishes that wasn't the headline you know because it made it <laughs> yeah. I've, had, I've had that conversation with her <laughs> but then second <laughs> that she only what she meant was having a fulfilling career and being fully present for your family at the same time yeah. right and so she to find it very narrowly and more nuanced in the article but then it got like all this play yeah. because of the cover headline um, yeah. so you know that happens to pieces like that, far more nuanced pieces a lot. But I, I think this is a really good time for me to um, talk a little bit with you about what you think is the better model, the better way to, um, or your ideal sort of movement, which is something called integrated Oh, mothering. integrated mothering. Yeah, yes. integrated mothering, which comes yeah. from. I was like, what is my solution? Yeah, no, no. <laughs> <laughs> hey, I read yes. your book. Yes. Um, <laughs> so talk a little bit about the ideal model and what, what integrated mothering yes. is and yeah. what it looks like. It's a framework. Yes, it's a framework. Okay, so I, um, I spent a, a fair bit of time speaking with this uh, researcher. Her name is Dawn Dow, and she's a sociologist, and she researches black middle class mothers. And part of the reason that she does that is because um, she felt like this particular group of women was really being left out of a lot of the motherhood conversation that was very much focused on white middle class women, educated women, and the only time especially black women came up in the conversation was in like, you know, the trope of the welfare mom and all of these very negative kind of conversations around low income black mm -hmm. mothers. And so she was like, well wait a minute, like the vast majority of of black mothers don't fit into this. And, and one of the things that she talked about was that, you know, um, f in the black community, first of all, like, Mothers have always worked. <laughs> yeah, like mothers have always worked. But also, it's not seen as um, a conflict or a negative. It's seen as um, a positive thing that you're doing for your family and for your community. And it's almost, it's like, ex it's expected that even if you don't like work for money outside of the home, that you're doing something outside of your own family and that those two, that those things are all part of being a good community member in general. Um, and so the, the framework is just very, you know, integrated. <laughs> it's just, it's just this idea of like that these two things are not in conflict, that they can coexist in, you know, one person's life and that they need to be integrated in a way that, um, that doesn't require you to be the best worker and the best mother at the same time. That like this idea that you have to be giving your all to work and to your family at once is just is you know impossible and never and is never going to make anyone happy and is also like destined to fail because you just can't you know um, so yeah it's very it's very uh, yeah sort of focused on shifting shift just shifting some of the ideas more so than the actual structure necessarily and then also because of whose alarm is going off um, also because of the uh, because of the structure of that community in particular, it's very um, it's very much tied into the idea of community mothering. Yeah, who is, watches the kids then? Yeah, who watches the kids? So it's a lot of like friends helping each other out, extended family helping each other out. Again, this idea of just taking a more community-minded approach to um, to family that I think would be very healthy for the rest of the country to embrace. <laughs> yeah.
So I would like, you, you said something that really resonated with me when you mentioned, um, like I stayed home to raise my children. So I would go to the tax man and say, okay, I've attended the Burbank Adult School. I've attended, you know, I how to talk to kids so they listen. And I'm taking those classes. And every book I read is about how to be the best parent I could be. And, um, and, and he would laugh at me. And I would say that's really a shame because, you know, there are people who, don't take parenting, you know, seriously, or they, you know, they're going through the motions or whatever. It's a, it's a hard job that we really don't address because, you know, taking and care it of has an impact when it's well, done badly. This is my concern <laughs> with what yeah. you're saying, and this is what I'm going to ask your opinion about. Mm -hmm. um, so, like you said. On my resume is my time raising my children, my 10 years raising my children, president of the PTA, head of fundraising, da da da, and, you know, on my resume. And, um, and I have fallen into doing what I do best, which is taking care of others. It's what I love to do. So I'm a professional nanny, and I also have other work that I do. And it is appalling to me how technology has interfered with our ability to be a parent. And bright screen, I don't know about you guys, but I'm older now, so I know when computers came, I was working on a computer and I would look at the calendar like this. Then I became 45 and I was looking at the calendar like this. And as time progresses and now with the phones, I'm wearing like heavy duty glasses, which I really attribute the bright light in your face attributes to the failing of the eyesight. And so you see babies with um, you know, parents are trying to work, they're trying to have it all, and they're, but they're not able to be present. So we've got bright screens and in front of kids' faces, because what, God forbid you should be bored? Yeah. You know, so I would like that in your, we need a community to raise a family, we need support of the workforce, we need not to look down on people who choose to raise their children and are blessed to be able to do so. Um, and there should be some type of, um, I think, incentive. Yeah. Like tax incentive, yeah, but, I agree. but proof that mm -hmm. you have here, you've completed this course in parenting. That you know, here's your proof. You know, proof that you that you've attended this lecture yeah. where where there's accountability for what you say you're doing. Yeah. But but my can in trying to change everybody. You know, the corporate world. Um, we also have to try to save parents to be present. Yeah. And not to depend on technology to pacify their children because they don't have the skills or they're tired and their day was hectic at work yeah. that they can't that they can't be present. So yeah. that that would be something also that would be worthwhile for you to incorporate with your campaign yeah. is how how to make how to make time for parents to be present. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think, I mean, I know it's a, it's a problem for me personally, for sure, that, like, I... Using the iPad as a yeah. babysitter. Yeah. Yes, yes. And um, a lot of times I think it is, I mean, one thing we didn't talk about is that, you know, um, there is, again, there's, like, an economic driver, too, right? That there is, there, there has been um, stagnant wages and increased cost of living over the last 40 years and there are fewer families who can actually afford to have a parent at home um, you, you know and even if it means like part-time working and whatever like I do I do feel like there are genuinely more economic stresses on parents today than there have necessarily been in the past and I think that that definitely plays into the desire to just be like here watch a movie you know <laughs> but, but it's totally one of those things that no one feels good about you know like the kid doesn't feel good about it the parents don't feel good about it and I think um, I actually one of the things that I suggest in the book is um, reinstating home ec but making it more like um, an adulthood class you know <laughs> like just thinking through like how to adults yeah exactly like encouraging people to think about like do you want to have kids or not if so what does that mean if not like you know just what is what do you want your adult life to look like and how do you create that 
Um, and if you, like I, I interviewed this one guy who um, is, I think he's probably 45 now and hasn't had kids and actually really wanted to have kids and was like, you know, I wish someone had talked to me about which kinds of jobs are a good fit for parenting because, you know, I actually really wanted to be a father and um, I went into finance and I work 70 hours a week and like I don't have time for a personal life and, you know, just stuff like that where I'm like, oh yeah, like if, I mean, I, I never, I never really thought about any of those things until I was already married, you know? Um, so I think kind of encouraging thinking about that and then also some amount of, of experience of like what it is actually like to be around kids for an extended period of time and like what are um, what are effective disciplinary techniques that aren't spanking because that's another thing that I think comes up a lot too is like frustration yeah like in our and I mean um, it's now it's like you know we've kind of universally decided, okay, it's not okay to, to spank your kids, but there hasn't been any sort of, I mean, most people I know grew up with spanking as the discipline, you know, <laughs> and so, so it's like, okay, we experienced a totally different disciplinary system, and and are now in this in this you know totally different paradigm, but no one has actually learned how to do it differently. Um, there's been no kind of there's no real there's no like training around parenting at all, and I, I think that it could be very helpful to have that in um, in schools. I was wondering if you see any correlation between the fact that it is that women um, have since Betty. Um, Gloria, Gloria, Betty Friedan and Gloria Steinem yeah. came onto the scene. If um, women have been fighting to break the glass ceiling, be represented in the community, I mean, in the boardroom, in the boardroom and yeah. equal pay for equal work, and their lack of um, of value as a mother, a stay-at-home mother or a caregiver. Yeah, there's definitely. I mean, there's that like that. There's, there's been a fight sort of within the feminist movement about this forever. Um, and <clears throat> in the, you know, in the 60s and 70s, it was very, it was, you know, there was a lot of, of stuff around if you're married and or you're a mom, then you're, you're sort of participating in the patriarchy, right? <laughs> um, but I, I do feel like it's, it's evolved a bit, but it is still very much this... Um, there is like there there is a a, a problem there with um, again with with what valuing yeah what liberation means and also I mean I think to, for me and this is why I I um, I don't know I get into arguments a lot with the lean in thing because <laughs> because I feel like you know the the goal of um, equality and feminism and all of these things is not to just slot women into where men have been in, a, in the existing system. You know, like, can't we have, like, let's be more imaginative, please. <laughs> you know, <laughs> can we think of a system that actually values caregiving, for example? Like, can we think of a system that's better than this one for both men and women? Um, you know, versus, oh, if we just get more women CEOs, like, yeah, no, that's not going to solve it. And also, like, women can be patriarchal too so <laughs> it's not like you know automatically um, if you're born a woman you you know you're part of the system you're, right. Yeah. Right, exactly yeah so um, I think yeah there's a lot of a lot of things that need to be um, kind of reworked around that and and also too it's like I mean anything that sort of automatically dismisses out of hand something that only women do is like a problem <laughs> you know it's like well if motherhood is is an issue then like you know no actually the issue is something else um well, yeah let, let me be respectful of all of your time here um again the book is forget having it all there are yes there are copies of it in the back and amy's going to stick around if you want to yes. talk one-on-one -on -one or have her sign your book thank you all so and, much for being such an engaged and thoughtful audience and, and i just wanted to say that in that catalog of of ideal jobs for potential parents. I'm not sure journalism would have been at the top of the list, <laughs> but I'm very thankful, and I think we can all be, that both of these ladies here tonight are in that. Thank you very much. <laughs>